Okay, I've got 103, so I think uh, we'll be mindful of people's time and, and get going here. So um, thank you very much for joining me today. Uh, my name is Dean McEwen. I'm the director of the Master of Management in Artificial Intelligence program here at Smith. So um, again, uh, your interest in artificial intelligence is combined with the interest of a lot of people. So we've got a, quite a few people signed up for this one. Um, to learn more about what we're offering in this program. Uh, logistically, we do have, uh, if you're not familiar with Zoom, there is a Q&A button. Um, so if you have any questions throughout, um, please use that Q&A button, ask your question right away. Uh, I do have my colleagues, Kit and Liz here, who can um, help answer some of those questions, particularly the ones that are more specific to you. Uh, and then if there are some general questions, they're actually gonna leave them for the end and I'll address them openly so that everyone can see the answers to those as well. Okay, let's begin. Okay, first thing I like to do here at Smith is do a land acknowledgement. So Smith Toronto is situated on the traditional territory of the Huron, Wendat and Petun First Nations, the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. We're grateful to be able to live, learn and play on these lands. And um, this is where you'll be taking classes in the MMAI program at Smith Toronto. Okay, and I'd like to be able to just let people know one of the things about Smith, uh, if you've noticed, <laughs> we have a lot of graduate programs. Um, what we've tried to do, what you, what you won't see, right, is, is a general program that has subjects of specialization within it. What we decided to do, um, you know, as part of our strategy actually is to be able to offer a specific program to groups of people uh, in society that need this specific education. So this is why we have a master's of management in, in artificial intelligence. We also have MMA, our analytics program. We've got a FinTech program, but MFIT, and we've got a master's in digital product management as well. And so, you know, depending on where you see yourself and what kind of skills you're looking to acquire and what kind of roles you want to develop in your career, uh, we probably have a very specific program um, that will meet those goals for you. So I just like to have this screen at the front and that way you know exactly what else is going on because we do get quite a few people who start taking class at Smith Toronto and they sit there and like, oh my gosh, I'd love to learn more about FinTech um, because those classes are on Tuesday night for, or Thursday night instead of uh, Tuesday night. So um, anyway, this is what you know this, we have these different programs. If something here piques your interest, do a little investigation and you can talk to our recruitment and application team about that as well. Um, they know about these programs too. Okay, so what is this one all about? MMAI. So this is a full master's degree, okay? You get it done in 12 months. Uh, you can certainly expect a lot of academic rigor as you study in this program. We do have exams, we have assignments, we have projects, we have presentations. And so you will be doing a lot of work to uh, gain this degree. This is something that's not pay your money, get your paper, uh, you got to work for it. And I think that that's the better approach for sure, that you're actually learning something as you take this program, because this program will really help you launch your career. Okay, we, we're, you know, just by the sheer numbers of people who have registered for this webinar today, um, we know that AI is on everybody's mind. Uh, it's just incredible. And to be able to get this kind of knowledge early in the AI stages, or what we'll call the AI hype cycle, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, but to be able to get this knowledge now, you're going to be setting yourself up for a very strong foundation for your career and your knowledge around artificial intelligence and the technologies that underlie it. Now, and this is where, you know, this is a perfect example. This is uh, from Boston. Um, this was an article or research that they did. Uh, now it's 2023, but it certainly is applicable today as it was a year ago. Um, you know, they they've discovered this, right? So they've discovered and confirmed that AI at work is, is a very interesting. It's both very optimistic, but there's also a lot of pessimism. There's a lot of concern. Um, and how is this going to affect our jobs and what are we going to think about? And so this BCG um, summary, you can see that the link at the end uh, or at the bottom of the screen here, but um, basically, you know, there's a lot of questions. Okay, that's the general gist of AI, artificial intelligence and business and work. How is this going to work? 
people don't know. And so this is why it's really important for people to understand the technology and think about the application of it. And again, this program here really focuses on the management of that, right? We're talking about the people. It's not a PhD in physics or um, data intelligence or computer science. This is about the management of AI. And so there's definitely a, a technical component to it, but you have to, we have to figure out how to live with it, right? <laughs> the technology is there. So now we need people who have enough knowledge about that to say, okay, how can we progress and how can we proceed? Um, and this is it that comes down to these three points, right? We got, we're in a situation now where the leadership is saying, hey, we want AI. We got to have AI. How are we going to do AI? We need to get it done now. Um, the study here shows 80% um, considers, 80% of leaders consider themselves regular users of AI. Um, that in and of itself is interesting to say what, what is the definition of AI. But um, when you look at the, co the comparison between leaders, managers, and frontline employees, it's really quite stark and fascinating, right? Because we know the leaders want it, right? They say they're using it, so they want to continue using it. They want their organization to use it. Managers are saying, okay, well, wait, wait a minute. What does this mean? How, how are we going to do this? How are we going to apply this? What is this even what is it, right? Uh, and so managers are really having some struggles. And then you get down into you know the employee level and they really don't know what AI is all about. They have no idea what it's going to have, uh, what kind of an impact it's gonna have on their jobs. Um, but generally through the media and through movies and things, people get very worried, right? They think about a robot controlled world. They think about um, layoffs and that kind of stuff. And, but we know, and we as a research institution at Queens, we know that AI, um, yes, there'll be some roles that may disappear as we go by, but at the same time, the value of artificial intelligence and certainly generative AI today is that it augments your work, right? It makes you faster, it makes you more efficient, makes you more consistent, um, which is great in a lot of ways, but does it help you be creative? Does it help you strategically? These are the things that still require people and people thinking. Uh, and so it's this augmentation that we really have to think about and how this is going to work. Okay, and I mentioned earlier the hype cycle for artificial intelligence. And so, you know what, the only reason I actually included this is because people are so focused on generative AI right now. Um, and it's, uh, it's really quite uh, interesting that they think about this, right? And, and what I wanted to show here is that there's a whole bunch of different uh, expectations around these different types of what are called technologies, right? And so there's, it's way beyond just generative AI. You can see generative AI in the middle. It's on the, the down heading towards the trough of disillusionment because I know I personally use it every day and I love it. Um, it makes my life much easier, much more efficient. I can get things done that you would normally have taken me a couple of hours. I can do it in you know five to 10 minutes with the right kind of prompts. Um, and so you know, I want people to think about, okay, artificial intelligence is much more than just generative AI. It's much more than ChatGPT or Microsoft Copilot. Um, there's a lot of other things that are out there um, that companies and, and organizations are working on. And so we have to be prepared for that, okay? And I'm going to talk about that a bit more when we get to the curriculum that we have in this program. And then... Uh, who are we at Smith, right? We, we are definitely thought leaders in this area. Um, this is a quote, sorry, I apologize for the many, many words on one screen. Um, but basically, I just wanted to bring your attention that Jaron Colsaricci, who's a director and our associate professor of marketing analytics with our Scotiabank Center for Analytics at Queens and Smith, um, she's a thought leader in this area. And so this is just an example of her being quoted in the Globe and Mail um, on October 3rd, not that long ago. And so, uh, you know, we are at the forefront of this. We are working with um, significant business and political leaders to make sure that, you know, Canada is prepared for AI and digital policy and how are we going to use artificial intelligence um, and that kind of stuff. So this is, you know, a pretty important, great article, by the way. And there's a subsequent interviews, of course, with Jaron. Um, so I highly recommend you, you Google that and take a look. 
Um, now, what are we doing here, right? So this is uh, really an important part. This gets me into my bit of a lecture piece here. Um, the bottom line is with any kind of artificially intelligent system, you need data. Uh, you can't do any of these things. You can't build any systems if your data is not good. Um, and so we want to have this foundation of verified and trusted data. That's extremely important. And then when you start thinking about building these systems, right, and you're running through the different models that you've got available to you, and we do what we call, you know, called progressive analytics, and that's about how you handle certain types of data and how you report on that data and what you can do with that data. So we're going to be looking at that in this program as well. And then ultimately, we're going to develop an artificially intelligent system that's going to make decisions for us analyzing the data in real time, looking at what's going on and helping you make a decision as an organization, as a person, and then not having any kind of people intervention in there. We wanna build a system that can actually make the decisions for us. Uh, now, how do we build AI, right? So this is where we start thinking about um, the different types of analytics that we look at. You know, we have descriptive analytics and that kind of data, you know, is what happened. You know, how many widgets did we produce this month? Uh, how many widgets did we produce last month? Um, but we also know that uh, predictive analytics is much more important to organizations. They want to know what's going to happen tomorrow. And so, you know, we have a lot of models around predictive modeling. Uh, one of the interesting things about this program is, if, you know, if, if predictive modeling is something that's really on your mind, um, you might be better off with the Masters of Management Art of, er, in Analytics program because that gets into more statistical analysis um, and the predictive modeling, that kind of stuff, um, than does this program here. This program really focuses on some of those technologies, which I'll talk about in a second. And then prescriptive analytics is really about optimization, right? How do we make sure that we get this, the end game, the meet the goals that we want to get? And we want to start thinking about not only descriptive data, but also the predictive modeling. And then we want to make sure that happens. We have to make some business decisions earlier in the process, right? Like where do we put our um, distribution centers? How many trucks do we need on the road? Um, how many people do you need in a certain area? Um, those kinds of things are, are help you optimize your operations and your organization. And then ultimately we wanna to get to this cognitive analytics piece where this automated artificial intelligence, um, whether it's you know the machine learning, supervised, unsupervised, uh, if we're running reinforcement learning, natural language processing, and then we build neural networks to make all this stuff happen. Um, those are the next steps and the final steps. So play of these systems, because once they're, they're, they're research resource intensive, it takes a long time to build them, test them, make sure you got them right, check the quality, then you got to implement the things, and then you got to be able to monitor and test it and make sure it's running the way you think it's running. And then this very quickly, um, my guess is a lot of people already know this uh, on this screen, but I just include this in case you don't. If you're new to artificial intelligence, um, the term artificial intelligence is extremely broad and it actually changes. Um, if you wanted to look at you know, a particular definition of artificial intelligence, um, something like spell check inside Word might uh, qualify as being an AI type system. However, nobody really thinks that that is an AI system anymore. We've kind of gone beyond that. And so that's where this concept of artificial intelligence, it moves and grows and changes um, as we develop these things. And so um, we, I think of that in this biggest bubble, uh, all this stuff fits inside there. Uh, machine learning, is where we're programming machines, we're building machines, we're building systems that can actually analyze the data as the data arrives, so in real time, and then it can run it through a model, it can manage its expectations, and then it can make a decision. So if you think about you know, uh, hotel pricing, that kind of stuff, right? It's looking at the number of supply it's got, it's looking at the demand of the people that are poking the website, uh, and it's coming up with a price automatically um, to be able to do that. So that's like a machine learning system. And then you get into this other subsection called deep learning, which is uh, it's, it's based on trying to get machines to think like humans. 
right? There's a lot of stuff around neuroscience that we still are not entirely clear with. And um, what we have found, and with the help of people like Jeffrey Hinton, we've discovered that we can build a computer system that makes these decisions for us. We just have no idea how it does it. But it does it really quickly and generally efficiently and generally accurately as well. So we know that you can do a multi-layered neural network that functions like a human brain. And it's making the right decisions for us. We don't necessarily know step by step or explainability to that that well. Um, but if you're trying to build a system that you don't really have to have explainability and you just want speed and accuracy, uh, then a neural network is good for you. But this is one of the things that this program is going to help teach you is, you know, how do you make that decision? When is a neural network the right way to go? When should we just do a standardized machine learning system, uh, whether it's supervised or unsupervised? Those are the kind of questions that we're going to be asking in the program. Now, I mentioned just briefly about, you know, if you're more interested in predictive modeling and statistical analysis, right, do the analytics program. And that's one of the fundamental differences between what I call MMA and MMAI is stats and math. The MMAI program is more about mathematics, right? You want to be able to understand not only, you know, what's going on in machine learning, but you have to understand the math behind the algorithm in order to be able to test it. You know, what learning model works best with this specific data set? That's a mathematical question. Um, how do I interpret the results of my model, right? Mathematics. Um, how do I evaluate whether my model will generalize to future data, right? Same kind of deal. This is not about statistical analysis. This is really focused on the mathematics part. And so we've got um, a very specific mathematics for AI course in this program to get you up to that level of knowledge so you can actually do some of these things. You can test your models, know which model is best for you. How is it going to work with different types of data? Uh, the program structure itself. So we are a business school offering a very technical program. So I would argue we have a bit of a broader approach to solving problems um, using AI and analytics than you would find in like a computer science or a data science or even an AI type program. Uh, we want to start thinking about those problems. What is the problem that the organization is trying to solve even before we think about applying technology to it? Um, so we've got that broader approach to solving problems. And we also have a very um, you know, 50% of the program is about developing business leaders. Okay. So we've got, you know, not only the team environment that we're working in, but we also have coaching provided for you as well to help you figure this out because, you know, you can build the best neural network in the world that does something really phenomenally, but if you can't explain it or persuade people to back you on that, it's not going to happen. Right. So you have to be able to work with people. You have to be able to storytell. You have to be able to convince people to support support you and to give you the resources you need um, to get these things done. It's rarely one person. It's always a team. Now, here's the curriculum piece. So as I mentioned, we have our method courses, and that's really where we get into, you know, like the mathematics for AI. We start looking at machine learning and AI technologies. We have innovation and entrepreneurship course as well, which is very important. You got to think differently, right? This is a different world. We can't do things the way we've always done it. Um, so we've got to think differently. And so that's why it's important to have that course in there. We do have our very technical courses in deep learning, natural language processing, reinforcement learning. Um, those are extremely important because those are the underlying technologies. Um, I just saw uh, Divya asked a question about um, covering LLMs or large language models. Um, so yes, definitely. I, had the, you know, I don't think you could have an AI course without LLMs in it nowadays. But, and this is the big but, is that you know when you look at something like generative AI or um, you know, Microsoft Copilot, ChatGPT, those sorts of things, which are large language models. Um, those are what I call products, right? They're not necessarily the technologies. And so when you look at these technical courses, we're looking at the technologies that underlie generative AI and large language models. So you can't do a large language model without deep learning, natural language processing and reinforcement learning or machine learning. Um, all those technologies apply to LLMs. So it's really important to understand that. And it, the reason it's important is because you have to think about the track record and the trajectory of these products. Um, you know, where's generative AI? Like, you know, where is it today? 
well, think about where is it going to be five years from now? Like that's that's a question that should kind of blow your mind because there's been such progress in the past two years. Uh, we can't even think about what's going on five years from now. However, we can start thinking about the some of the successes and sort of the pattern and the, the evolution of deep learning right, of, of natural language processing. Um, those sorts of things are really important. We've already got things like natural language understanding, which is grouping words and understanding what that group of word means versus what each individual word means. So again, very much more efficient, but you know, this is the track of where we're going. Um, and then we have our application courses, right? So, what, okay, now we got AI, we understand the technology. What's it going on in finance? What's going on in marketing? Um, let me think about doing this uh, project on my own, right? The capstone project where you can start using this technology and you can push it forward on your own. And again, huge talking point in job interviews, maybe supporting your own company by doing a capstone for them. Um, it's just a great opportunity for you to get that hands-on experience that you can talk about uh, in the evolution of your career. Uh, and then we have our power skill courses, because again, you can't do this without people. Um, so we have an introduction to management course, which is gonna teach you how to look at case studies, how do you um, critically think about a company and the problems that the company's faced with and start thinking about some solutions of how you're gonna fix that or help them with that problem. Um, Agile project management for AI, right? All these things are projects, right? They're projects, they're products, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, it needs some structure to make sure that you can follow the, the creation of these things and making sure that they stay on track and on under uh, budget and, you know, with the right kind of resources, the number of programmers you need, uh, what kind of uh, tech stack are you going to need to make this thing operational? Um, all these kind of questions are really important. So agile project management is important. AI ethics and policy, right? We can build these systems. We've got access to data that's unbelievable. Um, should we? Should we be doing this just because we can do it? Um, we need to have some kind of uh, a paradigm or a process to make some decisions here. And inside that decision-making process has to be some kind of ethical considerations. And are we meeting the expectations of our organization before we do these things? Uh, extremely important. And then again, leading change, the final course on that side, uh, leading change again is about people, right? Getting people to get you know the buy-in that you need to get this stuff done, right? You've got an idea, you've got an organization, you need to get some resources, you need to get support, you need to build a team. Uh, our lead, leading change course will help you with all that. Now, how does how are we delivered? So this program starts, we have one cohort per year. It starts in May, 2025 is the next start date. Uh, we have one a night of class on the week. So Tuesday nights for MMAI. Uh, and then we do one weekend day, a full day every other week. And that's basically the schedule for the entire 12 months of the program. Um, yeah, it's always in person. It's right downtown Toronto. So it's easy to get to. You can, uh, we have like parking in the building, but it's, you know, like a, what is it, like six or seven minute walk, I think from Union Station. So if you're on the GO train, you're on the subway, whatever, St. Andrew Station is right there as well. Um, we're right across the road from the CN Tower, the Metro Toronto Convention Center. So it's right there and very convenient to get to. We do have two full one week sessions that we run in Kingston at Queens, our main campus. Um, we have an opening session and then we have an innovation week as well. And so during those weeks, uh, you are expected to take time away from work. You know, whether you get granted work or you have to take vacation, uh, but you do have to come down here to Kingston for two weeks. Um, once you get here, right, you just have to travel here, regardless of, you know, how far you're getting that kind of stuff, you're driving, taking the train, bus, whatever. Uh, once you get here and check in with us, then we put you up in a hotel, we feed you for the week, we have some social events, we have other uh, learning opportunities for you too during that week. So it becomes a really good social, um, fun weeks. Um, certainly opening session is when you meet your teammates and your coaches and all that kind of stuff. Um, and you take a couple of academic courses. Um, throughout the 12 months of the program, there is ongoing coaching. So both team coaching, but also career coaching. Uh, we have networking opportunities. We have workshops. We have uh, book talks. We have authors. We have alumni panels. We have a whole bunch of different stuff for you to get involved in. 
Now, we've been talking a lot about the business side of things. So we are, is technical. We do have academic licensing for things like Databricks, Snowflake, Azure, SQL, Python, Tableau, and SAS. A lot of your assignments will be in Python programming. So you should have a, a pretty good knowledge of Python. You don't have to be an expert, but you have to be able to understand um, what it is, what it looks like, how do you call libraries, um, how do you pull data, that kind of stuff. So some basic Python skills. And then as a student, we have a number of workshops as well. And then there's clubs, there's a student leadership. We have a class president every year. Um, and uh, you know that class president and they build out a team, a class executive. And so they determine a lot of which workshops will actually get pulled into this class. Um, they're the conduit between the administration of the program and the student body. And so we work with them very closely to come up with, you know, whatever kind of extracurricular workshops and fun things, social events and stuff you may want to get involved in. Um, one of the other interesting parts down here, the cross program club called CLOF, it's Queen's University Alternate Asset Fund. Um, and it's very interesting because, you know, five or six years ago, it was all MBAs and master of finance students. Uh, but nowadays they're realizing they need to get some expertise on the, the quant side of things. So they, they do look for students from our MMAI program, MMA program, and FIT program. And so that's something if you're interested in, in investments, investment banking, and uh, capital markets, um, that's a great way to get involved. And, and again, build up even a bigger network than you would have had just in the class. Now, what's that class look like? You're at your fellow students, the average age is about 34 years old. Um, the range is 22 to 52 in the current year. Of course, that changes every year. But when you think about that, you know, you get some young people who come in with great technical skills, you know, um, not straight out of university. They always have to have a couple of years of work experience, but um, they come in with that. And then you got the older people who come in saying, I got to learn about this AI stuff. They've got the business acumen. They know how to get things done. Um, but they need to make this connection. And then we put those two groups right onto a team and that becomes very powerful. And that's one of the, the steps towards high performing teams that we talk about um, by having those different skill sets on the same team working on the same problems. And they just come in with different perspectives and some diversity of thought, which leads to some pretty creative solutions. Now, we also understand at Smith that, you know, people take professional master's programs for a number of reasons, but usually it helps with your career, right? This is what you want to do. So we do have what we call our career management framework. Uh, within that framework, we have a whole bunch of different options. So if you are looking for a job, just want to learn these skills to get a different job. Uh, we have a job board. We have um, workshops on things like writing resumes, cover letters, interview skills, mock interviews, all that kind of stuff. But even if you're just thinking about your own career, right, you're working, let's say, for an example, with a bank, and banks usually have long career trajectories if you want. Um, our career coaches can help you out with that too. Say, okay, I really want to be an executive VP, you know, within 20 years. And our career coaches can help you understand the steps that it'll take to get there and different type of educational opportunities, work experiences, those sorts of things. Um, they can help you map that out a little bit for you so that you're well prepared. Okay, so the admission requirement, this is a professional master's program or a full master's program. So you do have to have an undergraduate degree from a recognized university. Um, we will be looking for those mathematics courses or those stats courses in your, um, your transcript as well with some good grades, you know, at least a B. Um, and generally, people are coming from mathematics, business, commerce, computer science, economics, engineering. When you think about the commonality there, it's quants, right? You got to be comfortable with the quants and the math. Uh, you got to be not scared of numbers um, in order to be successful in this program. Uh, we do require a minimum of two years work experience. Okay, this is, again, getting back to that whole idea of a professional master's. We want people to come in with this work experience so they can contribute to the classrooms. Our classrooms are very interactive. We have a lot of case studies. We want to hear from fellow students as well as the professor about how to deal with certain situations, right? And so there's a lot of those discussions that happen. And if you have a couple of years work experience, you can contribute very well to those. You've seen it, right? You've lived it. You've been there. Uh, and we want to hear about those experiences. 
Um, we also understand that a lot of people have been out of school for a few years, and so they may not be able to get access to a, an academic reference. So um, we do require two letters of references, but they can be your supervisor at work and a colleague. Um, it doesn't have to be your current ones, but it could be past ones. Um, just make sure you pick them wisely because they do fill out an anonymous form, and we want to have a positive impact from those references. Um, we do need an official transcript from your undergraduate institution. So this is something that's mandated by the government. This has nothing, you know, we, we can't not ask for this. Um, if you can't, if your uh, institution was uh, from an international school, um, we will need to see an official course by course or detailed WES assessment. So the World Education Systems um, Assessment as well. So we'll be asking you for that. If you can't get an official transcript from your school, we will be looking for the WES assessment. Um, and then we can start this process with uh, nothing but a resume and a cover letter or a resume and an unofficial transcript. Um, once you submit those things to us, then uh, we can assign you an application advisor and they can help you out. And I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. Um, ultimately, there will be an interview probably with myself or an associate director. Um, that will be the final step. And then we have an admissions committee. One thing I do want to reiterate, though, is don't start the GMAT. Um, you know, talk to us first about that. Make sure you send in the resume, send in the official unofficial transcript, and then we can work with you to make sure if uh, if a GMAT is going to help strengthen your application or not. Um, I'd much rather have you learning how to do Python programming um, than spending time uh, studying for the GMAT, because I know that's pretty intensive for sure. So what are the next steps? So if you just send us like that unofficial transcript and a resume, um, there's a web form on our website. Uh, if you want to start that, then we can assign you an application advisor. And this advisor works with you again to make sure uh, that you have the strongest application possible. They'll guide you through the entire application process. Um, there's no fee to apply, so there's nothing wrong with, you know, kicking the can and, and seeing if, you know, if you might qualify for the program, um, because they'll work with you and they'll really help you and give you some advice on how to be successful in your application. Um, the interesting thing is we do do what we call rolling admission. So there's no cutoff dates to apply to this program. Uh, the only cutoff really is, you know, a couple of weeks before the program starts, we have to submit our numbers for hotel rooms and things. Um, and so at that point, right, then we'll, we'll stop. But, uh, you know, we only have the one start date in May. So it, you know, if, if we do fill up, um, and, you know, I think there was just shy of 200 people registered for today's webinar. So, um, you know, and we're only looking for a class of about 60 to 70 people. So um, there's definitely a lot of demand for this program. And of course, without a uh, cutoff date, um, the program could fill up very quickly. And if it does, then we will run a wait list. And then as people move in and out and defer and all that kind of stuff, uh, we'll go through the wait list for sure. But uh, Definitely applying now uh, would be a very good idea for you to do that. And then what are you getting into? You got to pay for this. So uh, our fees for the Master of Management and Artificial Intelligence program, uh, this is what we call a uh, private program. So it is not OSAP eligible. Um, and this is just one of the things that happens with um, politics and education in, in Ontario is that this program is considered private. So uh, there is no government assistance to take it. Um, there are other options, of course, for you, you know, borrow from your RSPs and that kind of stuff, um, school lines of credits. And, and if you're an international student, uh, we do have partnerships with Empower Financing and Prodigy Finance. Um, so there are avenues to get support and financial support. Um, companies, again, as I mentioned, there's not a company out there that's not thinking AI and how we can do it. Um, so I think that this is also the perfect time to ask your employer um, for some financial support in taking these programs as well. Um, but our domestic student fee is $68,350 Canadian. Our international student fee is $89,975 Canadian. Uh, this is an all-inclusive fee, so it does include your tuition plus your books and learning materials, any kind of software licenses, your meals and accommodations for those opening and closing sessions that we run, 
and it is payable with your deposits, a $5,000 deposit um, upon acceptance. And then the remainder is paid through three installment payments over the year. Now, Queens does have a monthly payment plan if that works better for you, but you actually have to be a student and in the program before you can sign up for that payment plan. So um, once you're in and, and enrolled, then you can talk about that with our business office. Um, students are responsible for those travel arrangements. You know, as I talked about our in-person sessions in Kingston, um, you have to get here. Uh, we've got students coming from all over the place, so we can't pay for your travel. Um, so you pay for that bus, train, drive, whatever it is. And then once you get here, we'll take care of everything at that point. Okay, so we'll cover the hotel room to cover your food. Uh, we'll cover parking, that kind of thing. Okay, and this is the thing I want to remind you, because we are a business school, right? And we want to talk about, okay, this is about business. Uh, we know that business value can be derived through analytics AI and the discovery of these insights that support our decision-making processes. Evidence-based decision-making is the future and it's going to be required and certainly uh, large organizations and their boards are demanding it. And the other side of it is that technology and artificial intelligence never works by itself, right? It's the technology is not going to get you there. It's going to be people. And you've got to be able to have these strong, what we call power skills or people skills or soft skills, whatever you want to call it. That is really important because in order to do this, you can't just build an AI system for the sake of building an AI system. You need to figure out, okay, what's this system going to do? What is the vision for you? How are we going to strategize around this? How are we going to implement this? Who's going to lead this, uh, this charge? Um, and who are we going to bring along, right? What kind of change management is going to be required? What kind of a team are we going to assemble to solve this problem using technology? And that's going to take a lot of work and a lot of work together and a lot of, you know, teams that have never really been built before, right? That's going to be very important because this digital culture is not going away, right? We're here, we're now. AI is only going to become more pervasive. And so it's really important for people to learn about it today so that we're well prepared and we can lead others into the future um, because the future is digital. Okay, so here's my, uh, my contact information. That QR code gets you to LinkedIn. If you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, that would be wonderful. Um, we do do a lot of um, sharing of information on there about artificial intelligence, analytics, fintech, that kind of stuff. Um, and there's my, um, my email address too. So if you have any other questions or concerns or whatever, please don't hesitate to, to send me an email and uh, I'll get back to you as soon as I can. But we also have a team of people here. I know Liz is online. We've got uh, Jen Mayer, who is our application advisor. And so we've got a lot of people who can help you with um, uh, your AI journey and picking the different programs. Okay, so that's the end of the actual presentation. I've got a few questions here. Um, so an anonymous person has asked, what kind of roles have alumni of this program gone into? Um, so that's a great question um, for sure and definitely something on everybody's mind, right? But what I would highly recommend, getting back to my QR code here, um, go on to LinkedIn. Do a quick search for Smith School of Business and the MMAI degree, and you can see basically everybody and their journey. You can see when they took the program. Uh, it's everybody's online resume. You can see the uh, the jobs they had before the program, the jobs they get after the program. Uh, you can see promotions. Uh, you can see job switches after that as well. Uh, this program has been running for about six years. So uh, we have a lot of alumni out there who have these experiences. And what I do, and, and this is the beauty of LinkedIn, is look for yourself. Look for somebody. If you're an engineer, look for somebody who has a similar engineering background. Um, maybe they're in mining tech and all of a sudden they're doing artificial intelligence. Well, there's a whole bunch of AI stuff going on in, in, um, in mining right now for autonomous vehicles, but also in exploration and digging and preventive maintenance and that kind of stuff. So I always look for, you know, somebody similar to yourself and then reach out to them. Right. That's the other beauty of LinkedIn is you can actually contact them. You can connect with them. You can set up a coffee chat and ask them about the program, ask them about those experiences that are relevant to you, and you'll get some truthful answers, right? I can 
you know, it's very easy for me to throw in a name uh, of somebody who has become an executive VP of a large organization, um, you know, in pure success, right? But you want to be realistic about this. You want to understand the pitfalls, the challenges. What's it like going from your background to this kind of an AI future? And is it the one that you see yourself doing? So I highly recommend that, uh, that you, uh, you do a little bit of investigation yourself. Okay. Okay, Divya with the uh, LLMs uh, conceptually, yeah, for sure. And so, so, uh, oh, that's an interesting part. Your ha last half of the question um, covering LLMs conceptually and how we as management professionals can bring it to our use. So, def I'm just trying to pick that apart. So I don't think we're going to be running through how to use Microsoft Copilot um, 101, right? We're not going to talk about that, but what we will be talking about is how do you build out, um, you know, natural language processing, right? Uh, what, what does that do? How does that work? How do you, what kind of data do you need to train these things? Uh, we'll talk about that level of interaction, um, not so much the use of a to of a specific tool like I guess at Microsoft Copilot or ChatGPT. Um, there'll definitely be some experiences, and you'll you'll be in a classroom full of people who probably do it. Uh, like I said, I certainly use it every day. Um, so we can talk about that. You know, that can be one of those sidebar um, questions, but I don't think it'll be a question on an exam. Put it that way. Okay, Nicholas. Um, oh, so you're talking about LLMs again? Yes. Yeah. So, um, yes, and fine tuning them and that kind of stuff. So, again, we'll be talking about that in the, the context of natural language processing. Um, but when you're talking about, yeah, you know, another interesting thing is about LL, large language models. And so we had, one of our advisory board members came and gave a talk to the AI class last year. And he was actually talking about small language models, right? Very specific language models that have been trained specifically on company, company information. And they, they're not guaranteed to give the right answer, but it's much more, it's much faster, but it's much more accurate than a large language model. And of course, if you've been looking at um, the energy costs of large language models and, and the, the the data that gets pulled into these things, um, they're large for a reason, right? And the question is, and this is a question you should be answering or asking yourself is, do I need a large language model to solve this problem? Or can I get away with, you know, maybe three or four small language models that are very specific to the problems we're trying to solve? So those are the kind of questions we'll definitely be dealing with in this program. Uh, who would be considered a strong applicant for the program? Well, I think uh, I went through that with the admission requirements, right? Those are the things. Um, the fact that you've signed up for this, you that shows that you have interest in artificial intelligence. Uh, we would want to be able to flush that out a little bit. Like if you're coming back, mm, let's say you have a history degree or something that's what I would call a non-traditional, non-quant kind of degree. Uh, we can talk about that and, and figure out why do you why do you, as a history graduate, why are you interested in artificial intelligence? And there's a lot of good reasons you should be. Um, because when you start thinking about, um, you know, history repeating itself, AI and ethics, um, leading change, all that kind of stuff lends itself really well to things like sociology, organizational behavior, uh, human resource management, all that kind of stuff. And so there's a huge impact on society when we're talking about this sort of digital transformation. And so, you know, regardless of your background, um, if you show an interest in this and you have a good reason why you want to do it, um, let's talk. We'll have that conversation. I'd love to flush that out with you for sure. But you do have to be comfortable with mathematics. I think that I'm going to come back to that. And uh, Python programming is something you should come into the program with a little bit of knowledge because um, you will be doing that in your assignments. And what you don't want to be doing is learning course content and learning how to Python program at the same time. That could become a little busy for you. Uh, so you want to start early. Right now it's, what, November? So you've got a uh, good six months uh, before you are starting this program. So you got lots of time to learn how to Python program. 
Uh, do you cover IT AI governance and due diligence from company perspectives too? So, you know, that's um, the governance is, is a very, so we don't have a course in governance. Um, we do have our AI ethics and policy. So policy and governance go hand in hand. So there was definitely be some conversations around that. Um, governance is a very hot topic. And so we, you know, quite often we'll have guest speakers come in and talk about specific organizations um, and how they do the governance piece, how you need to think about governance. Uh, and then on the other side of, on the technical side of governance, things like tools like Databricks and Snowflake and Microsoft Fabric, um, they have built in governance as well. And so these are things that we need to talk about. Right. We need to talk about governance. We need to understand what other companies are doing and why they've made the decisions they've made. Uh, and so these things, I it is my belief anyway, that this will be leaked into every single course that we have in this program. You will be talking about governance. You will be talking about the technology stacks. You'll be talking about doing due diligence and the ethical considerations of your decision making. Um, all those things will be covered. Okay, for the Vector Scholarship. So the Vector Scholarship will let you know you do need to be enrolled in the program before you're eligible for the Vector Scholarship. So that's one of the biggest, um, what I would call a challenge of it. So you have to get into the program before you can apply to the scholarship. Uh, I will also say the Vector Scholarship is extremely competitive. Um, so if you don't have a GPA of, you know, Queens has a 4.3 GPA scale. And if you're not a solid four of that 4.3, um, then you probably won't be considered for the Vector Scholarship. Um, but again, that's something that, you know, once you get your transcript in, into us, we can look over that. And if that's something that's of interest to you, uh, we can give you a very quick assessment um, on that because that's the Vector Scholarships. The lowest bar is a straight A student um, or a straight A, I think, in the past two, last two years of education, uh, whether you be eligible for that or not. So, um that's the Vector Scholarship. Uh, you mentioned classes involve a lot of group discussions. What does an in-person session look like? So that's a great question that you're asking um, because one thing we've started to do is actually have in-class visits. Um, so you can actually come here, uh, come to Smith Toronto. You can sit in the classroom, um, be a part of that classroom and see what it's all about. Uh, and I highly recommend that you do that. So again, uh, once you're connected, once you've sort of applied or inquired about the program, uh, we do have options for you to sign up for a classroom visit. And so I would encourage you to do that so you can see exactly what's going on. Okay, what about a sustainable lens? Is the usage of AI sustainable, carbon neutral? Uh, we could get into that <clears throat> for a long, long time. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to leave that uh, for now because um, we're kind of getting nigh on the time and I could probably go on for a couple of hours. But, you know, again, you're looking at my QR code there, click on that, and then we can have that discussion via LinkedIn or on email or whatever. And I can point you to some uh, some resources, carbon neutral um, is, well, again, it's like AI, it's pretty... Uh, um, broad concept of what that works and where it works and that kind of stuff. But uh, getting back to that point about, you know, small language models and large language models, uh, there's a significant um, carbon effect on those two things. LLMs uh, take a lot of energy. Uh, and so, you know, the smaller you go, the faster the process and you can get done, the less energy you're going to use, um, the more leaning towards carbon neutral you can possibly be. Okay, and I think that's all for the questions. Okay, any other questions before we go? Okay, no. So I think we're all done then. Um, so again, I encourage you to uh, to reach out to us, start your application as quickly as possible. Like I said, there's been uh, a heck of a lot of demand in this program. Um, so if you are interested in joining in May, I 
highly recommend that you start your application as quickly as possible. Um, we can do an application in under two weeks if we want, or if everything falls into place, um, or you can sit in the queue and, and think about it for about three months. But I think the important part is to start, see your viability for the program, talk to our application advisors, figure out your path forward, and then and work that way. So, okay, so thank you very much again for joining me today. And uh, hopefully I will see you in May during our opening session of the MMAI program. Okay, thanks a lot. Have a great day. Bye-bye.